Okay, everyone. Thank you all for coming. It's my very distinct pleasure to introduce today's colloquium speaker, Dr. or Professor Javier Duarte. Javier was an undergrad at MIT when he started working on particle physics, working on neutrinos, but that field wasn't exciting enough, seemingly. <laughs> and then when he went to graduate school at Caltech, he switched to LHC physics, working on the CMS experiment. Since then, he has been a Letterman Fellow at Fermi National Laboratory in Batavia. And more recently, he was appointed assistant professor at the University of California, San Diego. So let's welcome Professor Duarte, who's going to tell us today about deep learning for Higgs and new physics at the LHC. OK. Uh, thank you, Chris, for the lovely introduction. Um, and so I wanted to start uh, with a little analogy just to like wake everyone up, if, if for no other reason than just to wake myself up. Uh, and I wanted to start with sort of a, the difference between top-down and bottom-up processing, because I think it's relevant to the talk, obviously. Um, but here, uh, so to get the difference, take a look at this picture and tell me what, who you see. What is this picture of? <laughs> Abraham Lincoln, yeah. So you can, how many, how many people could get that that was Abraham Lincoln? Looking at that. Okay. No, no. Okay. So for those that can't, is it, does it become more clear as I, you know, give you a little bit more information? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one thing that you see here is that it was sort of intuitive or very easy to, to figure out what you were looking at because we all have a very good mental image of Abraham Lincoln. Okay. So let's contrast that with this case. What are, what are you looking at? Well, the CMS experiment. The CMS experiment, okay. It's a good guess. A rooftop with a bad column. That's another good guess, okay. I'll give you, okay, so let's go to another level of detail. Maggie Top. <laughs> okay, one, one more. Anybody? So somebody somebody's starting to think they know what it is. Okay. How about what how about now? I actually heard it heard the right answer already. Dolly, yeah, okay, starting to hear a little bit more of the right answer. And yes. So this is a, a famous painting by Salvador Dali, uh, called The Disintegration of the Persistence of Memory. So you can see we all recognize it once, or you know, recognize something like it once once you see it in full resolution. It looked better when it was buzzed out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, but okay. So you can tell that there was these two were very different sort of cognitive processes that were going on. On the left, you had this. Uh, we all had this very good mental model of Abraham Lincoln, so we were very able to, you know, pick out what we were seeing based on very little data, based on very little detail of the photograph. Uh, on the right, on the other hand, we actually needed a lot more data to be able to tell what we were looking, looking at, basically. So uh, this is very similar to the situation we find ourselves in now with LHC data taking. Uh, for a while now, particle physics has been dominated by a top-down approach uh, based on sort of theoretical expectations. So based on knowing what we expect to be there, so the Higgs boson, for instance, and then sort of confirming that with you know, very little detail, very little amount of data because we already knew what we were looking for. Uh, this may be changing, however, because we're entering this era of you know, high luminosity LHC where we're getting a massive amount of data, a truly tremendous amount of data, uh, and we don't really know what to expect. We don't really have a, ne a next Higgs boson that we're really targeting to look for. And so s instead, what we have to do is actually comb through all this data to actually look for you know, a, a, a subtle sign of new physics, which might be hidden underneath this uh, you know, massive amount of new data. OK, so that's. Uh, where we might be heading. Uh, but to sort of set the picture, let me actually describe a little bit the top-down approach uh, a little bit more. So of course, the top-down approach in particle physics is called the standard model. Uh, it describes fermions, which are the, uh, there's, there's two components. There's particles and their interactions. It describes fermions, which are on the outside of this wheel. Uh, and these are the particles that make up matter. And they interact via uh, fundamental particles called bosons, uh, which carry forces in between these, which mediate the forces between these uh, particles. Uh, and the other ingredient is, of course, the interactions, which fit uh, very nicely on this coffee mug, so that described by Lagrangian density. So this is essentially telling you uh, each one of these terms is basically mapping to some kind of coupling or interaction between, between two particles. So if you don't like looking at this equation, instead you can imagine sort of a graph. 
where each uh, link between two particles represents some coupling or some interaction between these two. Uh, and the newly discovered Higgs boson, as you can see, is a centerpiece of both of these pictures uh, because it really is uh, something that uh, ties the whole model together. All particles interact with it, uh, and it's a, a crucial uh, centerpiece. Um, and interestingly, it may also be a link to new particles or interactions. So it might be something that we can actually look for to see if there's uh, perhaps new particles uh, because it, it, it stands to reason that if it interacts with essentially all particles that we know about, it might also interact with particles that we don't know about yet. And so the way that we look for this is actually uh, to collide these uh, fundamental constituents at the highest energies possible at this uh, Large Hadron Collider located outside of Geneva, Switzerland at, at, the, at the CERN um, lab. So you can see here uh, it's a 27 kilometer in circumference uh, ring. Um, and to give you, to put that in perspective, if I uh, superimpose that on the campus here at the University of Kansas, you can see it comfortably fits, you know, much of, uh, of the campus as well as Lawrence. So just to give you an idea, I mean, you're really going from 70 to the, to the 10 and you're completely within the, the confines of the LHC, just to give you a, a sense of how big this is. Uh, so the LHC itself uh, collides protons at a center of mass energy of 13 TeV. Uh, there are four main uh, interaction points where detectors are positioned to observe the collisions. Um, and so you can see them highlighted here with stars. Uh, the uh, rate of collisions uh, at each point, there are basically 40 million proton-proton collisions per second. Uh, and this rate of collisions is actually too massive for us to be able to uh, store and process all of these collisions. So we select only about a about 1,000 per second uh, to store for offline processing. Uh, and this is done with a very complex algorithm called the trigger, uh, which we use uh, in order to uh, basically select which events to, to uh, record. Uh, the experiment I work on, and of course uh, uh, colleagues here work on, it's called CMS, and it's located uh, right there at the star. And you can see a head-on picture of it here. So this is as if you're you know, a proton coming in into the center of this, this collision. Sorry, I'm getting a spam call. Just silenced it. Yeah. OK. Um, so you can think of the CMS detector uh, as a big camera that takes essentially 3, 3D detailed snapshots of the collisions. Uh, there are different specialized components of the detector, uh, each, each one of which is meant to sort of measure a signature of a different kind of particle. Uh, all in all, there are about 100 million different readout channels, so you can really think about this as like a 100 megapixel camera. Uh, and one of the main things I want to point out here is actually the, the very large uh, magnetic field that this uh, detect whole detector is built around. It's a 3.8 Tesla magnetic field, which actually allows the charged particles to bend in this field so that we can measure their momentum. Okay, so to give you an idea of how all these pieces work together, let's see how CMS sees, for example, quarks and gluons. So quarks and gluons interact via the strong force, so they're actually never seen in isolation. Uh, instead, they become jets of hadrons, uh, so they're bound states of quarks and gluons. Uh, and it looks something like this. So you get uh, the charged particles bend in the magnetic field, charged hadrons bend in the magnetic field, uh, and then deposit their energy, uh, for example, in the hadron calorimeter that you can see in yellow highlighted there after they sort of shower in that uh, part of the detector. At the same time, you can also have neutral hadrons, which don't bend in the magnetic field, so they just go straight through. Uh, and then again, also deposit their energy in the hadron calorimeter. Uh, in the end, we sort of take all this energy and the tracks that we observe and we cluster them into these cone-shaped jets that you can see. So like if you imagine a 2D sort of looking at it uh, head-on coming in, it looks something like this. Uh, and these jets are sort of what we look at when we try to uh, reconstruct these uh, quarks and gluons. Okay, so uh, I've told you a bit, a bit about how we sort of detect particles and how, how we accelerate particles and how we detect particles. But then how do we actually produce the Higgs bosons at the LHC? So uh, LHC uh, is a proton collider, but that actually means it's mostly a gluon collider because of the, at the high energies. Uh, these, oh, let me put this over here for now. At these high energies, uh, gluon, uh, protons are mostly made out of, uh, the, the gluon density is the highest. Uh, and so since this LHC makes mostly gluons, you, you could ask, okay, how do we go directly from the gluon initial state to the Higgs boson? You know, from this simple picture, it doesn't, doesn't look like they directly interact. Uh, but these interactions can be sort of generated through a virtual interaction uh, where you have a top quark essentially running around in this loop and they connect the initial state of the gluons to this, final, to this uh, Higgs boson. 
Uh, and the natural question could be that, are there even heavier particles that can sort of play the, uh, play the same role? So are there heavier particles that can also run around in this loop and give you the same sort of Higgs boson going from an, a gluon initial state? And so what we can do is we can look directly for this kind of interaction. However, if that new particle is actually heavy enough, uh, then it, instead of looking sort of like this, where you have this uh, new particle running around in a loop, it actually will look just like a new point interaction, a new point interaction directly from the gluon to the, to the Higgs. So what we can do is look for sort of the interaction or the, the sum of these two contributions. OK, so then how do we detect these Higgs bosons? So once they're produced through, for example, gluon fusion, which turns out to be the, most, the dominant uh, production mode of 87%, uh, there's a whole range of decay modes that the Higgs boson can take on. Um, but the most, oh, sorry, technical difficulties. But the most uh, prevalent of these is actually the BB bar decay mode. So this is where it decays to two, a bottom quark and an anti-bottom quark. And even though this process is the most common and, and production decay mode, this particular process has never been observed. OK, so why is that? Uh, the problem is, of course, that there's many other ways to create a pair of bottom quarks. Uh, and in fact, just the uh, collision of two uh, quarks and gluons can give you a pair of bottom quarks very, very easily in, in the LHC. And so it's, since it's one of the most common things to make, it's actually very difficult to disentangle this uh, special signal, where the Higgs decaying to BB bar, from just the regular uh, QCD or, or uh, gluon initiated or quark initiated <coughs> production of, of BB bar. And since we can only see the uh, end decay products, we need clever ways to, dis dis to disentangle these two. OK, just to drive home the point a little bit more, uh, this a uh, little pamphlet you see here, this, the Higgs Hunter's Guide, uh, was you know, sort of a, a Bible of you know, how to do analysis uh, pre-LHC. You could see it on sort of everybody's uh, um, bookshelf before the LHC turned on. And you can read just right there, direct observation of an inclusively produced Higgs decaying to BB bar uh, at a Hadron Collider is impossible due to the large QCD backgrounds in combination with the inability to achieve extremely fine mass resolution in such channels. Uh, and just to uh, point out that this wasn't just something that was true in 1990 and is like, OK, everyone realized re right after that that it wasn't true anymore. Even going to the discovery paper in, from 2012, uh, it said there the decay, the decay Higgs to BB bar has the largest branching ratio of the five search modes, but inclus the inclusive signal is overwhelmed by QCD production of bottom quarks. So even then, it was still seen as this uh, you know, impossible thing to look for where you just have uh, the production of Higgs through gluon fusion decaying to BB bar. OK, so the rest of the talk then, after that uh, intro, is I'll tell you a little bit about how we actually do search for the inclusive production of Higgs to BB bar, and specifically highlighting this part, which is that we search for it when it's boosted, so when it's very high momentum. And that actually is the thing that saves the, the analysis. Uh, then I'll tell you about how we're upgrading the search currently using deep learning techniques and where we are, what the status is with that. Uh, and finally, I'll tell you about how we're using deep learning in various uh, ways throughout the CMS experiment, including in hardware, so for applications in the trigger. OK, so first thing, searches for boosted takes to BB bar. But before I go there, does anyone have any questions? No? Everything's super clear. OK, great. OK, so. Um, this statement about the Higgs being very hard to, Hig, inclusive Higgs to B bar being very hard to search for, is that it turns out it's actually true at low momentum. Uh, because at low momentum, the bottom quarks get resolved into separate jets. So you see them in sort of separate parts of the detector. They're sort of produced back to back. Uh, and this is very hard to, to tell apart from the background, which is just when it's initiated from a, from a single gluon. Uh, and so these two are essentially, this, is overwhel this process is overwhelmed by QCD background. On the other hand, at high momentum, something interesting happens, which is that the uh, bottom quarks get boosted and merge into a single large radius jet, like you see here. So the angular opening between the jets basically scales as the mass of the resonance divided by the PT of the resonance. And so at very high PT, you can basically get that these two get closer and closer together, and eventually you get them merge in a single jet. And so what happens is you also get a smaller relative QCD background here, because the QCD uh, momentum spectrum is actually falling off harder. So it's falling off faster than the signal spe spectrum. So the signal spectrum has a longer tail. 
Uh, moreover, these large radius jets have many interesting properties which you can exploit. So you can actually look at all the correlations between uh, all the particles in this jet to try to be able to tag or identify these Higgs to BB bar uh, jets. OK, so then how does the analysis sort of proceed? At a very high level, uh, we try to identify or tag these high PT Higgs candidate jets using a combination of jet substructure which is essentially how uh, the energy flow of the, of the jet, basically the direction of the energy flow of the jet, uh, as well as a, a custom uh, algorithm which we use to double B tag the jet, which means we're looking for the presence of two B hadrons inside of the cone of the jet. Uh, and then finally, the last uh, thing, we, the last observable of the jet that we use is actually the jet mass. So this is uh, where we essentially are trying to do, uh, reduce the search to a bump hunt. So we have the QCD spectrum is basically smoothly falling. And then the Higgs, we expect to be a bump, essentially, in the a peak or residence in this mass spectrum at 125 GeV. Uh, so the main backgrounds to this search, of course, are this dominant QCD background, uh, which is uh, more than 90% of the background, actually. Uh, and then two other very important backgrounds that we have are the production of W and Z plus jets, so heavy uh, bosons that can also be uh, created with initial state radiation, as well as TT bar plus jets, which is a relatively smaller contribution, but because it has two real uh, bottom quarks there, it can also be an important background. OK, so the, as I said, one of the main handles that we have in this search is actually being able to look for the presence of two B hadrons. Uh, so what does that look like? Uh, so B hadrons have this uh, special property that they have a relatively long lifetime which means they can travel order of millimeters before they decay in the silicon tracker. Uh, so what we can do is we can actually look for displaced secondary vertices, which are displaced by some sort of flight distance from the primary vertex. And from these secondary vertices, you have these displaced tracks, so that you actually have these, uh, you reconstruct these tracks, and they are coming from a secondary vertex. Uh, and these, secondary, and these uh, tracks will also have large impact parameters, so you know that they're not necessarily coming from the primary vertex. Uh, Finally, you can also have these uh, soft leptons, so, so very uh, low momentum leptons coming from this decay, as B hadrons will generate these uh, soft leptons more often. Uh, and then finally, because you have these two secondary vertices, you can actually look and try to correlate the position of these secondary vertices with the energy flow, so basically with all the energy going from the hadrons inside of the, inside of the jet. OK, so taking all of these together, we can actually combine these. Sorry, animations started again. So taking all of these observables together, we can actually combine them in a, uh, a machine learning algorithm, uh, in this case, a boosted decision tree with 27 sort of uh, by hand designed variables to, to look for this. Uh, and so what a boosted decision tree is basically, so one binary tree kind of looks like this. It's a series of sequential cuts on each of the input variables, such that at the end, you end up at a, at a final node where either you have mostly signal or mostly background. And then you can label the nodes that way. Uh, and after this, you can do this several, many, many times. You can iterate this where you have many different trees. Uh, and then you essentially combine all these weak classifiers into an ensemble such that you have one strong classifier at the end. So you use many different weak trees, like weak classifiers like this, to combine it into one strong classifier. Uh, and in the end, what you, get, what you get is basically an observable that looks like this. So here you have the signal in orange, and you can see it's very well separated from the background QCD uh, production of, of jets, uh, which is shown in blue. So you can see you have this very nice uh, peaking structure. And uh, the other thing is that we usually quantify this uh, kind of performance using a, a, a so-called rock curve. Uh, receiver operating characteristic curve. And so what this means is on the y-axis, we have uh, essentially the mistagging rate or the false positive rate. So what this is, is it's the number of, or the fraction of fake events or background events that we accidentally accept or uh, identify as signal. And on the x-axis, it's the fraction of real signal events that we correctly identify as signal. So those are the two axes. And so in general, we any single algorithm will give you some curve, some, some curve on this uh, plane. And the better the algorithm is, the lower to the bottom right on this, on this plot you'll be. Uh, and, a, and a classic sort of number that we quote for this curve is actually we look at what is the efficiency or what is the you know, uh, accept, signal acceptance at a 1% uh, 
misidentification rate and a 1% QCD mistag rate. So here you can see from this curve, you basically get about 30% Higgs to BB efficiency. So just to give you an idea, this is actually uh, you know a couple years ago when we did this. This was seen as like a very good uh, state-of-the-art tagger for this kind of jet. Uh, so 30% signal efficiency. Um, okay, so in order to validate this tagger, because I you know I've just essentially shown you the performance on simulation. Uh, so in order to tell how, how good this tagger is working in data, we actually want to be able to validate it with a, you know, a control region or something we, we know exists in data. Luckily, the standard model actually gives us a perfect sort of uh, um, stand-in for the Higgs, which is the Z boson. So this, we use it as sort of a standard candle in order to calibrate this tagger. So there's a couple differences between the Z boson and the Higgs boson, obviously. One is that the Z boson actually has a slightly different mass. So it's uh, 90 GeV instead of 125 GeV. The other thing is that the production rate of Z to BB bar in this kind of production mode is actually 30 times higher than the production of, the Higgs, of Higgs to BB bar in the standard model using you know, gluon fusion initial state. So this means that we actually have this very nice uh, situation where we, what we can do is actually first perform the search, essentially, or, or validation for the Z to BB. So we actually do the fit. We actually do our, our, our estimation and everything for the Z. We check how, how much our prediction lines up with the, expect, with the actual data. And then we can use that to essentially calibrate in situ this, the performance of this tagger before we then you know, proceed to look for the much smaller signal of the Higgs to BBR. OK, is that, everyone got that? OK. So how do we then perform the background estimate, or how do we predict the QCD background? Uh, well, the way that we do this is we actually use uh, the events that fail this tagger. So the events that pass the tagger basically you know, select you know, a bigger proportion of, real BB, of jets containing real B hadrons, or two B hadrons. On the other hand, jets that fail this tagger will you know, predominantly not contain two B hadrons. And instead, what we'll see is like maybe some background of, of a W boson decaying to QQ, which is at a slightly different mass. Um, but if we take that into account, what we can do is take the rest of the data which will be this smoothly falling QCD background, and actually use that to fit the shape of the QCD in, the, in this region that passes the tagger. Uh, and the only way this works is if these, uh, basically if this tagger is completely decorrelated from the mass. So this is an important thing uh, to actually keep in mind, is we want to make sure that the, uh, whatever uh, information we put into the tagger doesn't contain a lot of kinematic information about the, the mass of the jet. OK, so what does this actually look like in data? Uh, this is from the 2016 analysis, where we had 35.9 uh, inverse femtobarn of data. Uh, so you can see on the left here is the, um, so the data points are in, in the black. Uh, the background prediction is shown in the blue. Uh, the uh, W boson, which is the main uh, background, or the main resonant background in the uh, control region, is shown there in green. Uh, and in general, we're, after we subtract that, we basically are getting our QCD prediction. One thing to note is that there's these uh, steps in the step function in the prediction, but that's just because we're uh, actually doing this in bins of the transverse momentum of the jet, and each one of those bins has a different mass uh, distrib uh, a different uh, mass cut. So that's uh, let's say artificial, just of the the analysis. Okay, so we can take this and then actually uh, transfer this prediction into the passing region. Uh, and the first thing we do is actually, we fit, as, we, as I said, is we fit for the Z, in this case, to validate our methods. Uh, and what we find is actually this very nice agreement between the data and the Z, uh, the prediction for the Z to BB. And actually, we got the first five sigma observation of a Z to BB merged in a single jet. So this was the first time that this kind of topology of the, of the Z production was seen. Uh, and, we, and we got this, uh, this nice result. And so we can sort of consider that the, the tagging method is, is validated. And then we can proceed to unblind the Higgs window. And what we found is that a very small, uh, not statistically significant, but interesting nonetheless, uh, one and a half sigma excess when we expected about 0 0.7 sigma uh, center deviations. So the question, of course, then is, can this be a hint of new physics? Uh, so just to give everyone a chance to look at it. OK. So uh, what kind of new physics could we look for? We need some kind of uh, theoretical framework to look for a sign of new physics. So uh, what we can do is actually think about uh, new physics contributions, as I said earlier, to this uh, production mode. 
So in this case, uh, our standard model production mode looks something like this. You have this uh, top cork loop and you have the Higgs production in association with an, uh, an, an additional gluon. And so you can, take, uh, you can make a coupling modifier to that and we call it kappa T. So this is just a, a coupling modifier to the Yukawa coupling. Uh, and then you can have this new physics process which is uh, modeled just as a point interaction. So just as three gluons coming together uh, with a Higgs. Uh, and what you find is that if you shift the relative uh, ratios of these two new couplings, you can get vastly different Higgs PT spectrum. So this, what, is sh what, what we're showing you here is how the Higgs PT spectrum varies as you shift these two couplings. So this is the standard model one, which should be equal to one in the standard model, and this should be equal to zero in the standard model. But as you sort of shift these, you can get vastly different PT spectrums, going up to a factor of six, for example, at 800 GeV in, in PT. Uh, and so what we then do is basically try to uh, actually fit for this, uh, this difference by uh, combining all the different channels. So in this case, uh, we have the Higgs to BB uh, channel shown here in uh, green. And we actually combine that with the channels for Higgs decaying to two photons, Higgs decaying to two, two photons, as well as Higgs decaying to two Z, Z bosons. And that's shown in red and blue, respectively. Uh, and after you combine all these three channels, you get these uh, black data points as you see here. Uh, and then you can essentially fit this, this spectrum that we measure uh, using a, a parameterization based on these two new parameters, this kappa T and this CG parameter. And so what you get is what, is what, you, is what you see here. So on the y-axis, this is the new physics coupling. So this should be zero in the standard model. That's, where, that's what this uh, star signifies here. Whereas on the x-axis, this is the coupling modifier to the standard model. So again, this should be one in the standard model. And as you can see, we uh, sort of observe a slight deviation, but not significant. It's basically consistent with the standard model at one sigma, although it's slightly, it's slightly higher. Um, and so this is, a, in any case, this can, tell, this can tell us that this is not necessarily new a sign of new physics yet, but could become interesting as we collect more data. Uh, and to give you an idea of what that would look like, if we actually extrapolate forward the existing methods to uh, the high luminosity LHC, so we go to 3000 inverse femtobarn, you can see how far we would be. F so the current best fit is, lives right here, uh, and the uh, standard model expectations right here. So you can see that as we collect more data, we should be able to get a much more precise statement on this uh, Higgs PT spectrum. Uh, and in fact, the current methods would require about 25 times more data in order to get to like a five sigma discovery if, if we believe the current best fit was like a real effect, for instance, just to give you an idea. Okay, so uh, 25 times more data is actually a long time to wait, you know, since, uh, you know, we've already collected a lot of data. So the question is, can we do it sooner? Uh, and put in this new uh, Higgs gluon coupling, I guess it's C sub G, which would change a lot of rates. Uh, and we have a lot of information on what the Higgs goes to uh, Higgs scales like mass. Every place you look, uh, besides just the information you've used here. So if you use that other information, would that give you more constraints? Uh, yes, although the Overall rate does constrain this, um, but it only constrains it in one dimension. So, if you can, you can see here that there's one dimension that's really well constrained, this guy. This is coming from the overall rate, essentially. So the overall rate of gluon fusion production of going to Higgs is constrained really well. It basically goes as this like linear combination of of CG and kappa T. Uh, but the shape actually is the thing that's not well constrained right now. And we need more data to constrain that. And that's this dimension that basically did the, the opposite linear combination. Yeah. But yeah, this is a good question. So uh, the idea here is that we want to try to actually use deep learning to improve our uh, um, background rejection methods in order to get to a discover discovery level significance sooner. And the limiting factor in our, in our analysis is, of course, this, this dominant QCD background. Okay, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit now about deep learning, but does anyone have any other questions? Yeah, so when you talked about the double decaying efficiency, so you mentioned the 30% and the rejection was a little 1%. Yes. So if I do, and as a theorist, if I do the decaying naively, just we just multiply 70% times 70%, so 
But the reason why they say 30% is because the Higgs is boosted in one direction? Or? That's right, yeah. So, the, so um, if you just take, so it doesn't, it, exactly, it does, you can't just combine a single B tagging uh, because it's actually the, the two jets merge. Okay. So, so you. Because the space is going in the same direction. That's yes. Why the efficiency actually drops. Yes. Then when you do the uh, validation with the Z to BB bus data, do you also get an operate 30% or? Yes, exactly. So, the, yeah, so we measure a data to simulation scale factor, and it comes out to, I think, 0 0.91, so 90%. So yeah, it's a little it's a little bit lower than thirty percent, but it's but is it it's it, and it's within the uncertainty. Yeah. I come back to John's question. Surely there's also constraints from the type and the W channel. Yes. So Higgs to Tau Tau. Yeah. At at high momentum, you mean? Well, the, the end range of that uh, kappa versus strong momentum. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So I think, yeah, currently the, uh, those two analyses did not yet enter the differential combination. But for the full run two combination, they will, they will enter. Uh, and this was mainly because the analysis did just didn't have as finely segmentation in, in momentum before. But now they do, so they will enter this combination. Yeah. OK. OK, so. Uh, as a quick intro, so why choose deep to use deep machine learning at all? Uh, and so, well, deep machine learning basically is this uh, the use of structured neural networks with many hidden layers uh, as generic function approximators uh, to try to basically approximate the, the optimal solution for any given task. Uh, so why do we want to use these in particle physics? Uh, well, the short answer is that they seem to work. Uh, we also have lots of data and simulation to train them, simulation that we trust, unlike in many other fields. Uh, we also have fast ways to actually train them and, and run them with a lot of uh, new sort of software frameworks. Uh, and finally, and this is probably the more controversial uh, thing, is that we can possibly use these to gain new insights or think about things in a slightly different way than we have uh, up till now. OK, so you guys have probably all seen this slide before, but I'll go through it again anyway. Uh, so this is the classic fully connected uh, neural network architecture. Uh, the inputs are nodes that come in from the left, and the outputs are nodes that go out to the right. Uh, so you start with these inputs from the, from the left. They're labeled in this uh, Li uh, green here. So each input is then multiplied by a weight. And so the parameters of the network are highlighted in blue here. Uh, the weighted values are then summed. And then a bias term is added. So that's an additional parameter of the network. Uh, some nonlinear activation function is applied. And this is actually what allows the network to learn a nonlinear function of the inputs. So if you didn't have these nonlinear functions, of course, you would just have a, a bunch of a composition of linear functions. And that would always be a linear function. So you need some nonlinearity uh, in this case. Uh, and then finally, you can essentially repeat that uh, for each of these nodes. Uh, and so what you get is this equation that you see here. So any one of these nodes, for example, this guy, will be the sum of the weighted inputs plus some bias term with some nonlinear activation function applied to it, some point nonlinear activation function. OK, then we have this function. And it's really just a smooth function of the inputs. That's all it is. So how do we, how do we get something useful out of this and not just uh, random garbage? Uh, we have to train the algorithm. So that's, the algorithm is trained by varying the parameters in order to minimize some loss function or cost function, uh, which actually uh, all it does is it quantifies how many mistakes the neural network is making on the training data set. So what you're doing is you're trying to minimize how many mistakes the network is making on the training data set. And after you've done that, you basically have a trained uh, neural network that accomplishes some task. Um, training, yeah, how do you um, define the, what you're looking for? Do you use theoretical expectations for the various uh, channel? Yes, often we use simulation. So essentially what you said, theoretical expectation in order to train these algorithms. Yeah. Uh, so if we're trying to sort of differentiate signal from background, we generate a bunch of signal, we generate a bunch of background, and then we train it on this simulated sample of signal and background. Yes. So you're saying it, this is, it is dependent on the simulation we use. 
Yeah. Yes. If you didn't have any theory at all, where would you be? If we didn't have theory at all, uh, there are unsupervised algorithms that you can use, which, yes, exactly. You retire which, all the theories. You retire the theories, yeah. You're free and unsupervised. Yeah. There, the, the target is different, though. So in this case, the target would be a 1 or a 0 signal or background, let's say. So there's a truth. There's, this is the supervision. There's a truth label assigned to each simulation sample. For unsupervised learning, actually, usually the, the target is actually the input itself. So usually you think of things like uh, trying to learn some smaller representation which you, from, there, from which you can then extrapolate to get the full input back. So another way to say this is that unsupervised learning is kind of like clustering. You're kind of looking for groups in your data set that can be grouped together and that are distinct from one another. And then afterward, after you have all these different groups, you might then want to say, OK, how can I interpret what these different groups are? Maybe one is very cleanly signal and one is very cleanly background. In general, this will be much harder to do. So unsupervised learning is much harder. Um, but you can still do it. There's still ways to do it. OK. But to give you a very extreme example of repurposing a deep neural network for particle physics, uh, I wanted to talk about ResNet 50. So ResNet 50 is a deep convolutional neural network. Uh, it uses, uh, in, the inputs are pixels of, a, of an image. And you can think of it, it's very similar to the neural network I just showed you. The main difference is that the inputs are, are locally grouped together and the same set of weights is applied to each patch. So in this sense, you're actually using the same uh, neural network on different patches of the image. Uh, for ResNet 50, in sp specifically, it's c it has 50 hidden layers. Uh, and the number of operations is actually 8 billion operations, so in terms of like individual multiplications. Uh, and to do an inference on like a regular CPU on like your laptop, it takes about 2 seconds, which is a relatively long time in terms of CPU time. Uh, it also achieves state-of-the-art performance for natural images. So to give you an example, if I take a picture of an African elephant from Wikipedia, you can see the top ResNet 50 predictions are, uh, for example, African elephant is 90%, uh, Tusker is 6%, Indian elephant is another 3%. Now if I take, it, if I take uh, a picture of my dog, which uh, according to the rescue is, is a whippet, but mixed with something, but we don't actually know with what, you can uh, apply ResNet 50 to, to her and get that According to ResNet 50, it, it agrees with the rescue, so 47% Whippet. Uh, the second highest category is Italian Greyhound, which is actually a very similar looking breed, so we can probably ignore that one. And after that, uh, you get the third highest um, category is Rhodesian Ridgeback, so, uh, which is actually what I think it is. I think it's, she's probably Whippet mixed with Rhodesian Ridgeback, so just to give you an idea of how uh, eerily accurate this network can be. Okay, so. Can we apply ResNet 50 to a particle physics task? Uh, in this case, what we want to do is actually uh, distinguish between two different kinds of jets, particle jets. Uh, on the left, we have a top quark initiated jet, uh, which has basically these three prongs of energy, so these three di different quarks uh, which decay from it uh, and give you this, this very distinct radiation pattern. And on the right, we have sort of uh, regular light flavor QCD jets, uh, which give you this uh, very uh, distinct radiation pattern. So jet images uh, are a way of looking at these jets where you basically take uh, pixelated versions of these calorimeter hits in 2D, so in, in this eta and phi plane. And so what this looks like is a top jet on average, so if I take many, many top jets and I average over uh, many thousands of them, I get an image that looks like this. So in general, it's, it's black and white, so black means there's actually a higher energy uh, content in that individual cell. White means there's less uh, energy content in that cell. And then on the right, you can see QCD jets, which have a much more um, uh, lo uh, localized uh, energy deposit in the center of the jet. This is act after centering the jet in, in some way. OK, so on average, you can see it looks pretty distinct. But now if I take any one individual example of a, of a top jet or a QCD jet, you can see that the task of identifying which is which is, is a little bit harder. So on the left, again, this is just a single top jet example. On the right, it's a QCD jet example. So, uh, just to give you an idea, the, the task that the neural network has to do is actually a little bit, uh, is, is not so trivial. So uh, what I'll do is I'll show you sort of what ResNet50 thinks or 
what, what, how Resident 50 essentially looks at these two jets. And in order to do that, uh, I'm going to color uh, the top jets in blue. It's a little bit hard to see on this projector, but there's a slight blue shading here. And then the QC jet, QCD jet's in orange. So there's going to be a blue versus orange is going to be uh, signal versus background. OK, so uh, in order to show you, essentially, rather than just show you the rock curve of the performance of ResNet 50 as a top uh, quark jet tagger, uh, I'll show you essentially what, uh, how it kind of comes to its conclusion, how, how it's clustered, essentially, how it's clustering these two different uh, groups. Uh, in order to do that, first I have to explain that so each hidden layer of a neural network essentially computes a, a hidden representation. So you can think of it as like it's remixing the inputs into some new representation. Uh, sometimes it's called a latent representation, the hidden representation, same thing. Uh, and so the question is, we can ask is what is the separation between the two groups, the top uh, jets and the QCD jets in this latent space? Okay, so there's, uh, we can start this video, I think, yeah. Okay, great. So you can see that uh, overall, globally, there it's really good separation between the two groups. So again, QCD jets are in orange, uh, top jets are in blue. And if we then play so that you can actually see a little bit closer what's going on, you can see that even though globally it has very good separation between the two groups, there are a couple examples where it's definitely misidentifying one as uh, one or the other. So we can actually zoom in to try to understand a little bit better what's, uh, how it's different. So for instance, for this one top jet, you can see all of its nearest neighbors are QCD jets. So this is a, just happens to be a very QCD-like you know, top jet. Uh, but you can see it probably isn't that QCD-like. You, know, you can see there is this like, spray of some energy and stuff. So it does look somewhat different. But in this representation, as an image, uh, Resident 50 sort of it has trouble telling these two apart. So this is sort of giving you an idea of what are the limitations as well as what are the strengths of this kind of uh, algorithm on this uh, particular problem. Yeah, so this is just a final zoom in. And again, yeah, so you can see the top jet uh, image looks pretty similar to the ones near it. Uh, and so it's a little bit difficult to tell from this representation of the data. Okay. So that was just like an interlude just to give you an idea of how we we're applying deep learning. Uh, in practice, we don't actually just take you know, neural networks from industry whole cloth and apply them in, our, in particle physics. We typically design our own because in, in general, we can be a lot more computationally efficient because we don't need these huge neural networks to do the tasks that we need to do. Uh, so for instance, uh, one neural network that we uh, design is called the deep double B tagger. So this is essentially like an upgraded version of the tagger I showed you before. To, to identify Higgs jets from QCD jets. And so what we do here is we actually process low-level track and secondary vertex inputs as ordered lists. Uh, and we first feed it into this convolutional neural network layer. These are similar to the ones that are used in image, image recognition. Uh, after that, we also use these recurrent neural network layers, which are typically used in language translation. But in this case, they're actually more of just like a dimensional reduction, so trying to reduce the information down to a smaller number of, of outputs. Uh, and then finally, we also use the expert inputs that we used in the original tagger, so this like sort of hand-selected expert inputs. And we all combine those all into some, some fully connected layers. So this is a, this sort of standard vanilla neural network. And then finally, we, we try to get the decision whether it's a Higgs jet or a background QCD jet. OK, so what does the performance of this slightly deeper, slightly more uh, sophisticated neural network look like? This is actually just a reminder of the performance of the original tagger that we had uh, from a few years ago. And now you can see what the change is from going from the previous one to the deep, deep neural network. So you can see visually it's a very large change, like the, the two uh, background signal got much better separated. Um, but we can also quantify this more uh, rigorously by actually looking at the rock curve. And so here you can see that our original tagger, which got this 30% signal efficiency for a 1% mistag rate, uh, now we are able to get up to around 55% uh, uh, efficiency, so uh, basically a factor of two better signal efficiency for the same background rejection power. Or conversely, if you were really interested in the background reject, if you were interested in just improving the background rejection and you were okay with 30% signal, then you can get a factor of 10 more background rejections. So instead of accepting, you know, 1% of the background, you actually only need to accept 0.1% of the background. So it really is a big uh, gain over the previous algorithm. 
Okay, so um, the full run two results are coming soon. Uh, we're actually just uh, uh, we're, we're just getting ready to go for approval soon. So unfortunately, I can't show you the real data results for, for full run two. But uh, since you guys are so nice, I'll show you a little preview, uh, which is just the, what the simulation shows us we, we should expect for this uh, sort of sensitivity. Uh, so on the left, this is what the actual uh, 2016 data looked like. So you can see the Z boson peak, uh, was, which was this five sigma peak uh, with, the, with the 2016 data. If we then apply this new tagger in the 2017 uh, simulation, so this is just background only, so no, no Higgs signal here, but the performance is the same, basically the Higgs and Z performance are the same. You can see how much more prominent the Z peak is over the, over the background. And in fact, with essentially the same size data set, so 36 to 41, okay, it's very similar size data set, we now get around eight sigma um, significance for the, for the Z. So in terms of improving the significance, we, we get a very huge, very large gain, 50% gain in significance from this. Okay. So uh, I'm not going to talk about this, but I, I was going to maybe uh, advertise for the machine learning seminar tomorrow. Um, so I talked about how we went from uh, one algorithm to a, to a deeper algorithm with these, considering these uh, particles as ordered lists. Uh, however, ordered lists are not necessarily the most natural representation of a jet. Uh, so one thing we can do is we can consider these jets as sort of graphs of particles, of interconnected particles. And this is actually goes under a, a whole sort of subfield called geometric deep learning, also known as sort of graph neural networks, interaction networks, or message passing neural networks. Uh, and this is sort of the extension of deep learning to deal with data structured as a graph or a manifold. And there's many applications, and the sort of in particle physics is actually uh, an ideal testing ground for this because we have this irregular geometry for the detector. So you can imagine, you know, for tracking, for clustering, for reconstruction, there's many applications we can kind of fit this mold. And so it's, a, it's an exciting sort of development to try to explore in the, in the CMS data. Uh, and it's especially important in light of what's next, uh, which is, of course, the high luminosity LHC, which will begin in 2026, um, in which case we'll experience a lot more high, higher luminosity which will uh, re uh, lead to an increased event rate and many more simultaneous collisions or pileup. Uh, and this means that we're going to get, we're also going to get new detectors. So this means we're going to have a lot more complex data, which will challenge both our trigger and our computing, our offline computing. Uh, so in order to deal with that, we actually are trying to come up with a lot of new clever ideas, including using uh, machine learning in hardware. Uh, so this is uh, the last part. I think I'm almost out of time, but this is very short. So. Does anyone have any questions so far? No? OK. So as a quick overview of the sort of the challenge of trying to put machine learning into the trigger, into hardware, uh, I want to give you an idea of what are the limitations. So uh, as I said earlier, the level one trigger basically takes the 40 megahertz collision rate and has to reduce it. So after the upgrade, it'll reduce it down to a rate of 750 kilohertz. Uh, which means that we, we're reducing it down to about 2% of the events, so it has to reconstruct all the events and then filter down to just 2% in 12 microseconds. Uh, this latency requires an all FPGA design. There's not enough time, for example, to you know, get the data into a CPU and get it back out. We actually take all the data into these uh, optical transceivers and feed it into an FPGA where the computation happens and all in parallel, and then we get the data out. So the pros of FPGAs are that they're very high throughput, so you can get a lot of data in and a lot of data out. They're massively parallel, and they're relatively low power. Uh, one of the big cons, of course, is that it requires a lot of domain knowledge to program it. Uh, so usually requires programming in VHDL or Verilog, and a lot of electrical engineering help or, or support. So what we did is actually designed a, a tool, which we call HLS4ML, uh, in order to convert uh, machine learning models into FPGA firmware using this, uh, I, this uh, framework called high-level synthesis, which means we don't go directly to the VHDL or Verilog. We instead write sort of C++-like code, which then gets converted into VHDL or Verilog. So the idea here is that you can train a neural network for jet tagging or anomaly detection or any other purpose that you want, and then convert it to, this, uh, to firmware using this tool. So you can take a neural network that looks something like this and directly get the FPGA implementation out. Uh, 
And for this particular neural network, which was, uh, we used as a case study for jet tagging, you can do it in 75 nanoseconds, which is very much within the, the time constraints of, of the level one trigger. Um, but actually, FPGAs might, not, might be useful for more than just the trigger. Uh, so if you imagine sort of the different types of uh, hardware alternatives as a spectrum going from, on the left, the flexibility, so the highest flexibility or easiest to program, and on the right, sort of efficiency, so the, the most uh, computation per you know, unit power. Uh, on the left, you have CPUs, which of course are, everyone knows how to program you know, CPUs, um, but they're relatively, uh, they're, they're, you, know, you, you can't get as an efficient computation out of them. Uh, then there's GPUs, which are getting easier to program uh, now, now, and there's a, they're becoming more common. After that, you can have basically FPGAs. So these are sort of, uh, can be more efficient than GPUs, but they're of course a little bit less flexible, a little bit harder to program. And then finally, on that, the right side of the spectrum, you would have ASIC, so custom electronics made for a specific purpose. Uh, and actually, it turns out that industry is focusing on sort of these two ends of the spectrum, um, mainly for the increased efficiency and because they have a lot of engineering, you know, uh, person power. So to give you an idea of what this looks like, uh, so Apple has their A13 sort of neural uh, ASIC. Um, Mike, um, AWS has their FPGA uh, system, which they're, they're developing with Xilinx. Xilinx also has a lot of interesting FPGA coprocessors, which they're releasing. Uh, Google has an ASIC that's a TPU, or Tensor Processing Unit. Uh, and Intel, of course, uh, bought Altera, so they also bought a, an FPGA manufacturer. So all these companies are investing in this FPGA. So one of them that I wanted to talk about is this Microsoft Brainwave system. So, um, but yeah, okay, actually I should say, so for actually dealing with this computing, uh, th this problem that we have for the high luminosity LHC, where we have to do a lot more data processing, we have a couple options to deal with this problem. Uh, one is where we can try to rewrite all of our algorithms to take advantage of all these different kinds of accelerators, uh, which would mean that we have to sort of, you know, basically write a different version of our algorithm for each one of these accelerators, which would actually be very uh, difficult in terms of uh, person power. Or the other we can try to do is recast our physics problem as a machine learning problem, uh, and then sort of use the industry developed tools, which allow us to translate machine learning, you know, inference on and then accelerate them on all the different platforms. So the pro here is that industry will do a lot of the heavy lifting for us if we can sort of do our physics problems as machine learning problems. And so the one that we tested here was this Microsoft Brainwave system. And so this is a hybrid FPGA CPU coprocessor, uh, which can actually speed up uh, different kinds of algorithms. So the one that we tested was ResNet 50, since this one was sort of uh, already optimized for, uh, for inference. And so we tested basically this jet tagger that I showed you earlier based on ResNet 50. And what we found is that uh, it can process ResNet 50 in about 10 milliseconds. So showing, you, showing basically a 200 times speed up over just doing it on a, on a CPU. Uh, and so we can even do this through the cloud. Uh, so if you have it at a remote data, so if you have one FPGA at a remote data center and you uh, have your uh, LHC experimental data processing unit somewhere else, you can actually send the data through the cloud to the F remote FPGA, have it process the data, and bring it back actually faster than you can do it with if you were using a, a CPU locally. And it's even competitive with a GPU, even through this uh, cloud-based mode. OK, so to wrap up, uh, at the HLLHC, a new trigger system and new reconstruction algorithms are needed. Uh, exploiting deep learning for both of these, I think, will be key to the success of the HLLHC. Uh, FPGA and FPGAs and coprocessors generally uh, make deep learning algorithms fast and efficient. And so combining all these things, so high luminosity LHC, deep learning, and specialized hardware may actually enable us to do precision measurements of Higgs couplings, uh, as such as for new heavy particles and new interactions, and ultimately, hopefully, uh, new discoveries at the energy frontier. So thank you. <laughs>